your heart, you can't get up, you can't stay down You think this must be the end of a life But I'm here by your side, holding on, holding tight Come on friend, let's move on to a higher place Hello, oh my key so joe So pull up on me, wow I'll pull it on down Thanks a lot for joining us and uh, happy new year. I'm sure if you're wondering why we're wishing you a happy new year, today, the 31st of January 2013, we're wishing you a happy new year because this is the first episode of this program in the year of our Lord 2013. Now, part of the plan of the producers of this program is to broaden participation, which is in tandem with the philosophies of government to ensure mass participation in governance and of course to show government as transparent as possible and as accountable to the people as much as possible that's why in the last episode of this program we had the likes of chief ayo guladi on the panel three-time minister of the federal republic and reverend tope popola a cleric and a social critic today we are stepping up the game as we move to the academia as in the house to join us as panelists we have two lecturers from the tertiary education sector of Ikita State, one from the Ikita State University and the other from the Federal Polytechnic. But before you get to meet them, let's collectively, uh, on behalf of all the participating stations, say a big welcome to our guest, the Governor of Ikita State, Dr. John Coyote Fayemi. Mr. Governor, thanks a lot for joining us and Happy New Year. Well, Carla, thank you. Happy New Year to our viewers at home. May the year bring bountiful blessings to all of us. Thank you very much, sir. Now let's get to meet the panelists that will join us in driving the program for the next one hour. Let me start with uh, uh, the man from the Federal Polytechnic, Adoikiti. He's a chief and he teaches English and Communication Studies in the General Studies Department of the Federal Polytechnic, Adoikiti. Uh, one time Secretary General of ASU, that's an acronym for Academic Staff Union of Polytechnics in Nigeria. He's also a public affairs analyst and a critic, Chibayo Ogutuashi. Chief Ogutuashi, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you very much. The next gentleman uh, is a man that has so many parts. He's an associate professor of philosophy at the Kitty State University. And in addition to that, or before then, he was a one-time radio presenter and producer at the Radio OYO, or your state. He also worked as special assistant to former managing director of Daily Times Nigeria PLC, Dr. Yebi Ogumbi. He also had a taste of banking where he worked at the first interstate bank, PLC, as head corporate development, research and training. He is a media relations manager and image management person. And above all, he's Catholic and is a knight of St. John International. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us, Dr. Wiley Olajide from Ikita State University Philosophy Department. Thanks a lot for joining us, sir. I'm your anchor. My name is Kola Jumobi, and thanks a lot for joining us like you know as is it's customary with us on the program the first 10 minutes we'll take questions in-house uh, from the panelists before we have the first break and then we'll take participation from members of the public through text messages and phone calls and so uh, mr governor let's quickly set the ball uh, rolling and i'd like to start off from your broadcast to the people of ikita state uh, on the first of january i listened with the rapt attention and one particular aspect caught my fancy, which has to do with the homes agenda that you said you would promote. Uh, if I got the figure right, about 5,000 housing units are meant to be established through a PPP, public-private partnership, to, of course, obviously address accommodation problems uh, in Ikita State. 
what is going to be uh, the modus operandi of this uh, very ambitious uh, project, 5,000 housing units in Ikito State. Thank you, Kola. Um, the home agenda forms part of the eight points agenda of okay. government. If you look under the infrastructure development uh, aspect of the home or uh, eight points agenda, housing uh, is a standalone item there. And one issue that everyone who lives in and around Adrekiti knows is that uh, rents on the average are very, very high, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. And we could do a lot better to provide additional homes for uh, both the professionals, low-income earners, and even those who uh, want to live in uh, relatively low-density uh, areas. And a lot of these have come together. The home agenda is an integrated agenda. It's not really that government will build 5,000 homes. Okay. We have homes that would be built under a scheme for teachers. Uh, you would recall that I laid the foundation for this in Ikere, in Otsu, and in Aramoko. Now the developers are coming on stream to start that. Okay. Altogether, that's about 800 homes for teachers. We also have about a thousand homes to be constructed. These are mass, this is a mass housing scheme because we have managed to access some funds under the scheme known as housing, National Housing Fund through the Federal Mortgage Bank for civil servants, for uh, other income earners who want to uh, build their own homes and this is going to be provided for them and they'll be paying back at a relatively affordable rate. The third is what is being uh, put together by the Fountain Holdings. You know, we have a special purpose vehicle in the state known as Fountain Holdings Limited and Fountain Holdings have entered into a partnership with uh, Forbes International, which is uh, a real estate company outside the country in the UK, mm -hmm. to develop uh, a piece of land. If you not very far from the NMPC, uh, very near NMPC, that's where they're planning to build another uh, thousand units of uh, houses uh, that would form part of the homes agenda. So what government is doing is providing their neighboring environment, is also assisting the people who are desirous of accessing such funds to get the money. And at the same time, government is providing housing loans still for workers at the local government level and at the uh, state civil service. So it's going to be a continuous uh, exercise. And don't forget, we already have the model estate. We're going to be improving the infrastructure and providing sites and services in all those model estates. Okay. At Phase 3 would come there. The college is uh, going to be opened up. The current model estate we have is going to be there. We also have something coming up uh, known as the Diaspora Village. Uh, and the diaspora village is going to focus exclusively, well, not that we want to create uh, an island in Ikiti, but a lot of the people who are in diaspora are interested in putting up to build. accommodation, and they want government to serve as a vehicle for them. Okay. Some have had nasty experiences with family members who okay. have given money to, and the uh, homes have not materialized. So they're looking for a vehicle that is more reliable mm -hmm. and government is just going to offer a template for them to be able to do what they want to do with the resources they already have oh. out there. Okay. Dr. Wale Lajide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Governor, <clears throat> it was widely reported a few days back that you distributed loans worth 125 million naira to local government workers to enable them to acquire cars and houses. Yet it will seem that government remains relentless and unrelenting in its commitment to sanitize the local government system while not sacking any worker. What really are the facts of the matter considering the public outcry 
this has generated in some quarters. Well, this government has never hidden its commitment for workers. Uh, it's a worker-friendly government, and that is why some of these things that were not there when we came in, we have reintroduced housing loan, car loans for workers to be able to benefit of, uh, out of this and use it for the purpose it's meant for. But that is not, in and of itself, mutually exclusive from sanitizing the system, particularly ensuring that our workers develop a sense of self-esteem because they're doing what they're meant to do. They don't just go to work and sit down under the tree or go to work and sit in an office without having uh, a job of work to do that would make them feel that they're contributing to the development of a kids' state and Nigeria as a whole. And that's why we've said it's absolutely important for us and it is in the interest of the genuine workers that those who are not legitimate workers should be taken out of the system. And it's a very simple scheme that we have adopted. The biometrics exercise that has taken place in the local government is meant to specifically identify those who are genuine workers. And what do I mean by genuine workers? You cannot be genuine if you don't have a letter of appointment uh, that originally gave you the job in yeah, the first, first place. Instance. And two, if you have a genuine letter of appointment, that letter must have been issued on the basis of certain qualifications that you claim to have possessed. Earned. Yeah. So if you possess those qualifications, it's a very simple exercise. Just provide the original, not notification of result, not uh, uh, to whom it may concern, <laughs> but the original certificate yeah. that earned you that job in the first instance. Once you've done that, and then the story. you're safe and secure. But we have also said that there are those who have been offered positions for political reasons in a system that has no provision for such people in the scheme of service. Take holders of national certificate of education, for example. There is no room for them in the local government scheme of service. And some of them are being treated very badly because they remain stuck on grade levels wow. that are not even up to the grade levels that their qualifications are supposed to, to carry them to, to, to earn. And we feel, look, if you're an NCE worker, uh, NCE worker and you're sitting in a local government without proper and adequate attention being paid to you, go to SUBEB or go to Teaching Service Commission, provide your certificates yes. and go through the screening. Once you satisfy those in charge of that, you'll be absorbed into the teaching profession and even placed on a salary that is commensurate and commensurate with your level of qualifications. There are also inevitably people who are deemed to be redundant because there really isn't anything for them where they are. And it's the job of government to find a mechanism for ensuring that those people have something doing. Either they go to some of the other services where we need uh, people to work in. Agriculture, for example, yeah. tourism, uh, traffic management. You have a whole range of places. I don't want people to always misconstrue. I know that government may have behaved badly in the past in certain circumstances. That's why we're trying to reclaim the trust of our people. If you have nothing to fear, nobody's going to sack you in the local government uh, system. Once you have all your qualifications right and you have your letter of appointment, there's no problem. You, you, you have a job in the local government. All right, uh, Chief Ogutwashi. Mr. Governor, one of the schemes that is very bare to your heart is the social security scheme, yes. which enables our elderly. elderly people to keep body and soul together. At the moment, 
there are about 20,000 beneficiaries and government has sunk a colossal 1.2 billion. 100 million a month? Yes. Yeah, you're right. The government intends to widen the scope. Now, two questions arise. How does the governor intend to widen the scope of beneficiaries? And two, there are allegations of bias in the administration of the scheme. What is your excellency's reaction to this? Thank you very much. Let me take the second question first. On allegations of bias, if anyone has any evidence whatsoever uh, to show that we are either partisan in the implementation of the uh, social security scheme or those who have legitimate claims to earn it have not been able to access it, then we will look into that without any question. So what I do know is that sometimes when people make these allegations, they are not based on any fact or evidence. The social security scheme that we operate in equity is, is unique in certain respect. Yes, it is for everybody who is over 65 yes. years of age. But there are two qualifications, critical qualifications. One, you must not already be a pensioner okay. who is on the payroll of government because you have worked for government yes. and you've retired successfully, you already earn an official pay from government. That's one. The second is if you have a chief of Gutu Ashi as a son yeah. or a Dr. Lajide as a son, yes. you're really not entitled to a kitty yes, it. state social security benefit because it is assumed that your children take care of you, they'll be able to take care of you. So this is really meant for a category of people who are genuinely indigent and really can make good use of this money. When you look at that woman on the calendar, uh, there, the Ekiti State calendar, uh, the January uh, photograph, you can see the passion with which she was counting the money she had just been given. That money may not mean much to you and I, 5,000 naira, but to that old woman, a lot of difference. It's a lifeline. Okay. And that lifeline, when you look at it, uh, it is doing a lot in the lives of the people there. And usually, it circulates in the community. This is not capital flight, no money taken out of the kitty. It is in that community where they collect it that they spend it. And it contributes to the growth of the economy in the local community. On your question of expansion, you're absolutely right. We were spending on average 100 million naira on the social security scheme every month, on the 20,000 people that are on it. And we certainly want to expand it. But let me give you some statistics that would interest you and then ask you to link it to what I said earlier about the various categories of people who are qualified. By our estimation, it is 2.348 million people are 5% of that population who fall into the category 4-5% of the elderly. So you're talking roughly 820,000 people who really should earn that money and that means we're only catering to a fifth of those who should earn the money now. But when you look at the population of the, say, old teachers who are on pension, the retirees from various sectors, you'll be surprised that there are also in the region of about 20,000 in the state. And then when you take into consideration those who really should not qualify because they have a Kyodi Faimi or a Wali or Lajidi or a Chivogutu Ashe as children, you're looking at about 50,000. So really, those who should earn this money, the really indigent 
population that we are catering for is already about 40 50 percent and we have another 50 percent roughly to to attend to and our commitment is to put in roughly another billion or so into the scheme in order for it to uh, expand and cover all those who should genuinely uh, be within the the social security safety net all right let's take uh, the last question in the first segment before we have the very first break on the program and it's got to do with another very current issue uh, the german consul general uh, was in Nikiti a few days ago for a two-day working visit and he described ikobosi as a treasure base and the question comes to mind when will this treasure base be officially opened and government plans to develop the Ikogosia Fualai Ikolinoro tourism uh, corridor, which is also a very important part of the eight-point agenda. Thank you very much. Well, I, I was glad when uh, the, the Consul General came in to, uh, to see me and said he noticed a huge difference driving into Ekiti from Ocean State. Now, immediately he entered Ekiti, he knew that there was something different about this place. I mean, that could be a diplomat talking, but uh, it could also be a fact of what he actually saw. And being a hiker, according to what he told me, of course, the hills must have mesmerized him. So, clearly, it's a treasure trove. Not just Ikogosi, but Ekiti as a whole. Uh, it's a beautiful place to build, and we haven't yet uh, taken advantage of the beauty of our land. But specifically to your question, I want to say that our people should not be in a hurry. Uh, I was pleasantly, uh, I would say, shocked at the huge turnout Ikogosi witnessed in December. And that also taught us a few lessons about certain things that we really must put in place in order for the place to be properly managed. And that is why we've kind of delayed the full commissioning of the scheme. But I'm reasonably confident that um, by the end of this month that we're entering, February, everything would have been in shape. It's virtually ready now. Uh, if you go to Kogosi now, you can have free wireless internet. You can uh, sleep there. The rooms are ready. The uh, conference facilities are ready. Everything, the roads are ready inside the, the complex. So we definitely have it fully ready. But in addition to that, you know, Ikogos is meant to be a hub of a wider tourism corridor that goes all the way to F4, Ipole Laura Waterfalls, and other uh okay Messi, war museum and other facilities around there not ignoring the Ogunire, Olosunta, and other beautiful tourism spots that we have in the state but we needed something that can provide a center of gravity that others would uh rally around and and what we're doing essentially is uh, working in partnership with a South African facility management organization, Mantis Group. Mantis has been in Ecogosi now for three months, working with the builders and the uh, designers there to extend the work that is currently on to include um, a games reserve. Ikogosi used to have a zoo in the past. People forget that now. So we're putting a games reserve there, and the Mantis Group runs one of the largest games reserves in South Africa, the Shanwari Games Reserve. And that's what they want to model it after. And then put another three-star hotel there, because ultimately the 100 rooms we have now, if growth comes, it would be inadequate. Uh, and in addition to that, put additional facilities in the Pole Loro end of it. Of course, make sure that we have um, what they call a theme park, as well as a golf course in the uh, Pole Loro end of the uh, uh, facility. So it, it's going to be a beehive of activity by the time it's fully ready. Right. Yeah, looking forward yeah. to seeing that. It's at this point, I would like to have a very first break on the program. It's Mitchell Governor, January 2013, episode.
Deus tem graça. Our eight point transformational agenda represents our vision for a greater equity, where the business of governance is not only transparent, but accountable and responsive. Where we create optimum opportunities that will improve citizens' lives and attract investments. Where quality education is a right, not a privilege. Where good and cheap health care is not a luxury. Where our land is evergreen and no single child goes to bed unfed. I as a person I really commend what the Mr. Governor has been doing so far. At least if someone should just enter the state capital now, you see a lot of developments. So we are interested and we we all like the way it's turning us uh, is moving the state forward. If you are like one of the uh, old garage to Ojumoshe, the, 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 the work there is somehow slow. And, uh, Governor Wang Biyongi, Papa Julio Tabaja, the city of Tawali, but he's changing the power now. Then, I almost couldn't have been locked up. In fact, he didn't watch everything he gone. In fact, he didn't have a chance to get life. Life, 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 Okay. 
I say, I wish him good luck. We will continue. It is God that is going to reward him about what he's doing. Good governance is all about transparency. Consensus, responsiveness, and inclusiveness. The leader, not just talking, is listening. Meet your governor. You're right, you know. January 2013 episode and we'll take a few matters arising from the box box before we return to in-house questions and of course the barrage of text messages pouring in in their torrents. Uh, Mr. Governor, I noted about four points raised uh, from the box box. One had to do with water provision, the other one okay in sanitation and then there's one on old garage to Jumoshe's slow pace of work and the exo student who complained about the high uh, tuition fees. Maybe you just, uh, take Thank you, Kala. Yes, I picked up on all those four, uh, and I think, um, I mean, the fair comments. The, these are people who are in the eye of the storm. They're the ones on the streets, and it's important to listen to what they're saying. I, I think the Ojumoshi Okeyemi exists has witnessed a much more rapid um, uh, work pace. Uh, I don't know when that vox pop was done, but. I was there a couple of days ago and I noticed that both there and in the Atikon side of the dualization, work is progressing at a much faster pace. Um, but the, the workers can still do a lot Better. more. And I, I will talk to the contractors working on it. On the sanitation fair point, I, was, I went around at do okay. on Saturday on the Environmental Sanitation Day. And that's an area that we're going to be paying a lot of attention this year because once the roads are fixed people need to have places we'll have more people on the roads mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that we take care of the uh, waste that will be dumped inevitably by the uh, increasing level of um, use on those roads so it's again a, a fair comment to respond to water for us is life water is something that we've started work on uh, this last year we commissioned about oh. six, um, if, if you add the Mary Hill, Hill. to it, uh, F1, okay, Messi, uh, we still have a Poile Laurel and then you know, to commission and we'll, we're, we're likely to finish that before April. Oh, and then we're doing two major, uh, water initiatives, Ero and Egbe Dam and only, uh, Yesterday, uh, we, we, we've received very positive news that um, we've, we've managed to win one of the bids we put in for uh, the National Water Urban uh, Initiative, which should give us enough money to put pipelines around virtually all parts of the state and resuscitate the work in uh, AB and uh, a raw dams to full capacity so that the water coming from there can also service uh, all the areas that are meant to be serviced. But pending the time we do that major rehabilitation, we are in the course of the next months up to about April, putting solar ball holes and um, uh, uh, other uh, hand pump uh, ball holes around the states, particularly in the most critical areas like Emore, 
uh, is uh, uh, and um, Ekiti East. But the water in Ekiti East is even going to get to Omo. Omo has not had water since 1981, and we've been trying to get the pipe worked from uh, Ode, Simbode, uh, Omo. And we've suffered a lot of difficulties there, but I'm reasonably confident that we've, we've overcome that, and water should flow a lot more regularly in that axis as well. All right, Mr. Governor, before we go to the text messages, uh, you have... Let me talk on, okay. on the fees before you go to the text messages. Right. That's a, a big constituency. I don't want to ignore the, yeah. the students. Um, education as well. I, I think it's important to state without any hesitation that in the tertiary institution that is under our care, mm -hmm. The Ekiti State University government pronouncement stands. The tuition fee is fifty thousand naira. It has not changed, and I think that fact should be laid bare to students. However, the university management has made it clear to me that there have always been associated fees yeah. around faculty fee, yeah. departmental fee. Student union fee. Alumni, they have all sorts alumni. of alumni. They have all sorts of fees that they charge students. All I can do is appeal to them to reduce this to the level that the students can manage. But that has nothing to do with government. That's more to do with their own running of the university. The fifty thousand that we have requested that the university charge on tuition uh, stands. That's that's what they're charging. But they should effectively collect that because I also know that there's been difficulty in collecting the, the tuition in the past. Uh, but under the current administration, I think they're making an effort to have a biometric exercise done in the university as well for effective collection of uh, what is due to them. All right, Mr. Governor, you have called uh, the year 2013 year of consolidation and empowerment. Yes. And uh, I can see that Dr. Wale Olajide is angling <laughs> to ask the next question, which has to do with education, particularly uh, post-consolidation university funding. Mm -hmm. He takes that, and then Chief Ogutua, she takes one on roads before we go to uh, the text messages. So, Doc, Thank over you to you. Much, uh, Mr. Governor, <clears throat> we must commend the successful enactment of the AKD State University consolidating all the tertiary institutions into the AKD State University for improved standard and funding. Mm -hmm. And from the point of view of logic, effective and prudent management of resources, it's a very, very sound idea. But post-consolidation, the continuous play will be for more enabling funds from government so that the bowl of rice that was meant for one now being consumed by three could be subsidized in such a way that the, the pain and the strain are not so much felt. It's a new year. What is Mr. Governor's package for the university? Thank you, uh, Doc. <laughs> well, you know, my relationship with the university is not just as governor and visitor. Yeah. I mean, that stands that anyone who is in this seat has the onerous duty to be the visitor to the university. I'm also an academic, first and foremost, before becoming a politician. And I have a passionate interest in ensuring that our university becomes a world-class university. I've said that without hesitation. I've also promised to teach myself in the university in the course of my service as, as governor and post uh, service as governor as well. But the challenge here is not to misconstrue the structures, physical structures, as university because in the case of the two other universities, supposed universities that were in existence, and they were just shells. They were no universities. Either Tunedic, which even had no license as at the time I became governor, so it wasn't a, a university. A, a university. <laughs> and the science and the technology university at Ifaki, 
they were essentially just uh, shells. But yes, they've been consolidated. The good news with that is, you're right, government is never going to be able to fund university on its own. But I also think the university has a duty. I talked about effective collection of tuition fees earlier. The university has a duty to generate resources that can match within, that can match whatever government is putting in. The university here has not had any capital funding from government for 30 years until I became governor. This past 2012, the university got about 350 million. Still not enough because they, they wanted about a billion for their capital projects. But we weren't able to, to, to afford that. We yes. gave 350, and I believe the anatomy uh, building, the physiology building, and one other building had come out of the resources that we made available. We still have to continue to look at creative ways of funding the university and adding more funds. This year, we've pledged in the budget to give more money to the university and to the uh, College of Medicine that um, is going into its clinical years. Uh, we would never relent in doing that. But I, I do think the university, too, must play its part in terms of generating its own resources and ensuring that the resources generated actually go into the coffers of the university nice. uh, rather than elsewhere. So th th those are the, 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 that's the balance we must strike. That's food for thought. So, <laughs> yes, uh, Mr. Governor, please let me, give me the indulgence to use a double barrel um, approach to this question. Now, roads. Government has invested heavily on roads and this venture is commendable. Now, by the time government is through with this, we should be able to traverse the length and breadth of our their state within one hour. Now, the saw points are the Ado, oh, yeah. if I can, I then Ado Ikele, those two. Okay. Your Excellency, when do we have respite on this? Now, two, the appeal court directed the state government to set through the financial uh, uh, entitlements of sacked elected local government chairman. This government is superintended by a governor who believes in the rule of law. How do you react to this? Thank you, Chief. Uh, on the first one, yes, sir. It's, um, it's an embarrassment to me. Uh, we've had such great difficulty with the contract of Adoi Worokoi Faki, uh, as well as the refurbishment the, of, of Adoi. In fact, we haven't had that much problem with that. It's just that the road is bad and we're, we're fixing it. I think this one is the major issue. Uh, but um, we probably wouldn't have even had this road come this far if we have not come into office because I've had to literally sit on the head of the contractor to get the work to this level. And now, I am reasonably confident that the road will be delivered because the most difficult portions, the, the, the stones on IME, at School of Nursing, uh, between Ifaki and uh, Iworoko, all of that is gone. All that is left on the road now is stone base and asphalting overly from i think they even they've gone past back pathfinder now to the iwoko end of it they're doing it from the iwoko and uh, from the faki end of it and uh i don't want to give a date because that becomes a source of uh, contention <laughs> too. But I, I want to say that I've given them the, rains, uh, the dry season deadline to finalize whatever is left on, on the road. And I believe the contractor would live up to expectation. If I had my choice, I would have revoked the contract and start all over again. But that would have even cost the state more money. Uh, that's why I decided to keep the contractor. On 
me I do a career accru you know that's a federal road again just like I do a faki it's a federal road but our people are not really interested in whether a road is federal or not they just want to be on good roads on I do a faki we already spent something in the region of about six billion and they refunded about two billion I think about six months before we came into office and what is outstanding on it is about 4.5 billion now uh, as refund uh, by the time they complete the road and we've paid everything that we have to pay we're probably going to be owed about 8 billion on the road alone uh, and that cannot stop us from our own roads that's why the real roads that belong to the states we're still spending money on those uh it, it's it's a cat 22 but we feel that roads are so critical to creating the enabling environment for investment that we want to so that if you live in omo you can walk in adwekiti effectively and you're here in less than an hour every day okay. the person who is living uh alimosho will not get to lagos in two three hours but you you're already in Ado, and you can leave your work by six and still get home to eat dinner at seven. So I, I, I think there's no alternative to that. We must continue along those lines. As for the second question, thank you very much. The, 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 the decision of the Court of Appeal uh, comes to me as a surprise, but the Court of Appeal is empowered to give decisions. Uh, what the Court of Appeal has asked me to do in my own understanding of the law, I'm not a lawyer, but I've been around lawyers and I've sat in courtrooms long enough. I, I know that the Court of Appeal is asking me to put something on nothing. And what do I mean by that? The election, suppose the election that brought the local government chairman, chairman to office had been declared null and void in itself so if that had happened how do i pay the, the, the benefactors it's just like asking me with due respect to my brother governor Oni, i'm not paying him any entitlements because he had been declared an illegal government and a personal non grata as far as the governorship of Ikiti state is concerned so, if anybody is asking for entitlement now, he's not likely to ask for entitlement because he knew what happened. And I don't agree with that. The only option left to me yes. is to file a notice of appeal to that. If the Supreme Court agrees with the Court of Appeal that the chairman are really entitled to uh, uh, this, yes. I wouldn't have a choice. I, I agree with you. I, I, I am a respecter of the rule of law, but I always like to exhaust all my options. That's why I went to Court of Appeal when the lower court threw my case away uh, here in Adwekiti. All right, then let's take a look at the text messages popping in. The first one says, uh, Good evening, Your Excellency. Please, sir, when will you implement the 27.5? percent teachers peculiar allowance in the Kitty state from uh Tommy Singh um, okay. the next one from Binga Nikwede Adwekiti he says please your excellency we need your assistance concerning the land and housing loan checks that have not been given to us after our names had been pasted since September 2012 by the authorities in the land and housing loans board the third one, we heard that the checks are being given out on a monthly basis uh, to their colleagues and friends where, names, where their names are not pasted. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, this is like the head that wears the crown. <laughs> Your reaction, sir? But is that really possible? <laughs> well, colleagues <it's> and friends? <laughs> I'm sure. I don't know what has happened, but okay. if the but their names pasted since September mm -hmm. 2012. 
they should have their checks by now. But what I can promise him is that I will find out from the head of service. Okay. Uh, because I think this relates more to the civil service, civil service rather yes. than the local government end yeah, of it. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll find out and uh, maybe during the next episode. Uh, Meet the Governor episode, I would share that information with them. All right. This, uh, the next one, Your Excellency, I just want to appreciate your administration for the payment of contractors that supplied eggs and for approving autonomy for Erinjiyo. Ekiti, the people of that town are already singing, a, singing plus four plus four. Okay. Your Excellency, please, sir, what are you doing about the Gede farm, Gede farm settlement? Gede, mm -hmm. Gede farm settlement. Mm -hmm. Patrick, please, you have to move the prompter a little bit closer so that I can get. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, Gede. Gede. Let me start with Gede. Gede is the beneficiary of massive operations. Mm -hmm. Gede is where we have the cassava processing factory and the cassava farms. Uh, Jill Flower is there. The Datsco Dutch Agricultural Trading Company that has just mm -hmm. come is going to operate in that axis as well as um, Yemero axis. And um, we're resuscitating the uh, farm settlement there, uh, uh, both for the use of ADP and the use of all that commercial farm operators. But we still have small farm holders there as well. Okay. And many of our uh, youth in commercial agriculture, YCAD, mm -hmm. they are operating in the Gede Axis okay. uh, as well. As for the gentleman who talked about autonomy, well, autonomy cuts both ways. They may be celebrating there. Um, I'm still appealing to the communities out of which they have gained their autonomy to try and understand that government is only just following the law. Okay. Uh, many of these cases have gone as far as Supreme Court. They've won their right to autonomy. And it, just as the uh, chief mentioned, it would be responsible on the part of government to just ignore all these judgments that had been given on the side of Umu, K, Kota, Eginio, not Eginio, by the way, it's Eginio in Eikoti, and um, Ijaro in uh, Ilejemeje local governments. So, so for, for us, we're just following the law. Following the law. Uh, we're not for or against any community. We're, we're for all in Ekiti. Uh, it's just that um, I, I thought... There's no point for this to continue to linger. It's been on the cards. Virtually all my predecessors had dealt with this matter without any Hello? resolution. And um, we, we just felt we, we needed to do what we had to do. Uh, on the 27.5% peculiar teacher's allowance, I, I think, Hello? as I have said to the NUT, uh, the NUT leadership still met with me not too long ago. And we discussed this. I have said to them that the old question of 27.5% was uh, hobbled by the interest in relativity at the time by the teachers. They opted for relativity package of 33% because I said I was not going to pay the two. You either go for one or the other, and they went for 33%. But minimum wage has since uh taking over that whole structure now we have a full minimum wage in place and they're entitled to the 27.5 percent and we have said we will pay the 27.5 percent but there's a difference between can't pay and won't pay <laughs> won't pay is that you're just not interested but can't be maybe as a result of your cash flow situation yes. and your availability of resources. Mm -hmm. And I've had calls to sit down with the NUT to discuss uh, the implications of this and, and, and also giving them a reasonable assurance that perhaps if we have fortunes improve uh, with our finances in the shortest possible time, we will pay uh, the 27.5% to them. 
All right, Mr. Governor, the moments are really <coughs> ticking away and we must draw the curtains on this episode of the program and save the rest, like we say, for another day. Another day. Perhaps uh, in a sentence or Hello? two, uh, since this is the first episode for the year, uh, leadership is all about taking uh, decisions Hello? for the collective uh, good. What would you say perhaps has been your toughest and no. maybe or maybe not the most unpopular decision you have taken uh, for the collective good ever you became a governor? Hmm. You know, Kola, I have said something recently, and I think it's even in the newspapers. The interview is being published in a couple of newspapers. I have said that um, educated people, they're easy to real, to govern, but difficult to manage. <laughs> because every equity indigent that I know, that 2.3, 2.4 million people, we have 2.4 million governors. I see. They all have opinion about what I am doing that is wrong and what I'm doing that is right and what I should be doing differently. And I think that is something that is good that we have an enlightened population. It's difficult. It may even distract you, but ultimately our people mean well the good and the most difficult thing is actually in this job is that word you used taking decisions because once you take any decision there are people on the positive side of it and there are people on the, on negative, the negative side, side of it okay. and the people on the negative side of it would never see your argument yes. yeah decisions must be taken yet you must take decision in this job <laughs> the local government issue that we described is one of such. Although what we're doing for, for example, those who are NCE holders is actually in their ultimate best interest. Mm -hmm. But some don't see it that way. Would you describe the loan as a carrot and stick approach? I don't know.